Uh, good evening. Uh, and a uh, very warm welcome to the uh, fall 2021 OP Jindal Lectures at the Centre for Contemporary South Asia at Brown. The Jindal Distinguished Lecture Series was endowed in perpetuity by Sajan and Sangeeta Jindal to promote a serious discussion of politics, economics, social, and cultural change in modern India. My name is Leela Gandhi. I am a faculty at Brown. And I'm absolutely honored to introduce our distinguished lecturer for this semester, the path-breaking and internationally renowned, award-winning artist, public intellectual, and filmmaker, Meera Nair. I'll introduce our other distinguished discussants later in the evening in order of appearance. Meera Nair was uh, uh, raised in Orissa, India, and partially educated at the iconic Miranda House College in Delhi University before transferring on full scholarship to Harvard University to become a visual and environmental studies concentrator. Since then, Nair's impressive filmography includes classic documentary and feature films, such as Salam Bombay, Mississippi Masala, Kama Sutra, Monsoon Wedding, Vanity Fair, Hysterical Blindness, The Namesake, Amelia, the Reluctant Fundamentalist, Queen of Katwe, and most recently, the long-awaited BBC TV series, A Suitable Boy, based on the novel by Vikram Singh. Meera Nair is a recipient of countless prestigious awards, the uh, Camera d'Or at the Cannes Film Festival, uh, the Jury Prize, most popular film and prize of the Ecumenical Jury at the Montreal World Film Festival, the Golden Ocella and Golden Lion Awards at the Venice Film Festival, and a Woodstock Honorary Maverick Award in 2004, to name but a few. She has no less prestigious nominations, including for the Academy, Golden Globe, Film Fair, and BAFTA Awards. In 2012, Nair was awarded the Padma Bhushan, one of the highest honors for civilians in the Republic of India. Meera Nair serves as faculty at Columbia University and combines this work with activism and engaged thought across multiple geographies. She pioneered the annual filmmakers laboratory, Maisha Film Lab in Kampala, Uganda, for training young directors in East Africa. From the profits of Salam Bombay, she created the Salam Balak Trust, which works with street children in India. Mira Nair began her career as a student of cinema verite, the name for the style of truthful and observational documentary filmmaking pioneered by Edgar Morin and Jean Grouche. Her work has since been celebrated for its uncompromising realism, uh, e.g. commitments to filming on location, the slums of Bombay and Uganda, the use of local languages and music, um, and unflinching sociopolitical commentary. But Nair's oeuvre is observational in another sense as well, uh, clarified in the well-known Heisenberg effect. Allow me to paraphrase with uh, some substantial poetic license. Any assiduous and principled act of direct observation 
alters the phenomena under investigation. It is this work of transformational observation, let's call it, which makes Nair's vision uniquely world-building in every detail of her extraordinary output. She generates livable futures where least one might expect for impoverished children the world over, for victims of sexual and domestic abuse, and the many casualties of racial injustices. As well, she will always be remembered for her fidelity to and reenactment of the precious solidarities of the Global South, enshrined in the Bandung Conference of 1955 and in the early American Civil Rights Movement. Mira Nair will address us today on the topic on being brown before it was fashionable, reflections on a cross-cultural journey. Please join me again in welcoming her to Brown. Thank you so much, Professor Gandhi, and the pun is uh, fully intended in the title. <laughs> um, thank you so much, and thank you everyone, honored uh, guests and friends, and. Uh, Opie Jindal, I used to know an antique dealer, Opie Jindal, I'm sure it's not the same person who has endowed this lecture, but thank you for inviting me to this august uh, situation. Um, if we don't tell our own stories, no one else will, and the idea of telling one's own story in cinema is what has shaped my life. I believe that there is nothing more extraordinary than life itself, uh, that the truth of life is inevitably more powerful, more electric, and stranger than any fiction. I came to making movies by that study of life, a form of making cinema called Cinema Verité, the cinema of truth, the cinema of how to observe life in all its beauty, in its contradiction, in its complexity. And today I will share with you some of that journey, my own journey, of how my cinema went from the art of observing the world to the art of creating it on screen in a fictional way. Little did I know that the bedsheet that would be tied around the columns of the veranda of the Bhubaneswar Club would be the curtain that would forever inspire me towards a journey of storytelling beyond that sheet or on that sheet. In the early 60s, where I lived and grew up in Bhubaneswar, Orissa, a state in eastern India that many of you would know, we lived in identical government bungalows. Eight by five was my address, and eight down the road was another home like ours that was fashioned into the Bhubaneswar Club. Uh, and here, um, fancy dress uh, parties were held, uh, billiards and bingo were played. I'm obsessed with what we called uh, housey then. You know, two fat ladies, 88, with skinny legs, number 11, ulta pulta, 69. <laughs> but, uh, 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 you know, one day I will put that in a film. Uh, but in this, in, in this, every Saturday night, movies were shown, random choices that existed from Hariali or Rasta, an old well, Bombay film to John Wayne's Hatari. And we were a bunch of kids and adults sitting cross-legged on the red oxide veranda. We all come from somewhere. We must know whose shoulders we stand on and what work we build off and know that the roots that give us the ability to fly. My roots were actually was growing up in Orissa where the Jatra or the traveling mythological theater still roamed and was became a very powerful and early inspiration. I would go off with my driver to uh, you know, obscure school fields and two actors usually bombed on hashish would recite incredible tales of Prahalad Nataka, of great, great tales of the, the good over evil. And it was that amazing glory of the oral tradition that completely transported me. Yet, despite the enchantments of small town living, I dreamed of escape. My brothers were sent to the prestigious Mayo College, but I was supposed to be satisfied with the all-girls convent in town, taught by non-teachers whom I called ladies-in-waiting, each waiting for an arranged marriage that was bound to happen. 
My father would not hear of my complaints. He was a big fish in a little, little pond. And he said, tell me what's wrong, and I'll fix it. And that was the last thing I would do. So I began what I called my campaign of gibberish. I substituted pure gibberish for all my homework instead of words. Omajan, don't take a, a tip from me. Uh, my teachers, though, knowing it was me, uh, continued to give me A's, not truly reading my homework. And in this way, I carefully and patiently crafted my escape to a better school in the Himalayas, another convent, though, an Irish Catholic school, Thara Hall, um, where Mother Teresa came from, in fact. And uh, this was a place that, where I first fell in love with America. I was sick one day up in the mountains, and I was being rushed to a hospital in a, in a horse-drawn carriage, because that's how we moved around those days. And it was James Taylor who comforted me night after night uh, with his haunting voice and his iconic lyrics of his classic song, Fire and Rain. And it was the era also of the Vietnam War. It was the music of peace and protest that fueled me and the great conversation of race in To Kill a Mockingbird at the time that we were reading. And the wild imagination also of the group theater, of, of Grotowski as well, of Jean-Claude Van Italy and Joseph Chaikin that inspired me, and especially the speeches of Malcolm X that we read under the covers of our counterpanes. The nuns had forbidden us to call them anything but counterpanes, and they were essentially bed covers. Um, it, this was a portrait of an America that was so freewheeling and so different and so full of, it appeared, youthful protest that kept me wanting more. After a stint in political street theater in, in Calcutta, where I worked with the great radical playwright Badal Sharkar, uh, and we made themes of things that were interesting to us. The first play we made was on political apathy called Jalous, and we took it out into the streets. Um, I, uh, it's a long story, but I'll make it a very quick one, applied to different Ivy League colleges, thinking they'd have the money to support a young civil servant's daughter. Uh, and uh, long story short, the only thing I got a big fat envelope for in admission was from Harvard, which was, I had a full scholarship. And I found my calling there in Cinema Bahite documentary film, uh, because my first cinematic education began with the great teacher, Ricky Leacock, who pretty much, along with Jean Rouge and the, the gang of them, had invented the style with mobile camera, and he was teaching me. I began to be fascinated by Cinema Bahite because it was a way to work visually with life. It was a way to capture the inequities uh, that I had always lived around and that I was quite obsessed by. Like, is this, can we do anything? Can art make anything that can change uh, this inequity? And, uh, and, and it was more powerful and stranger than I thought fiction. And cinema, then I, I got educated with more narrative films, with the films of the Japanese, the, the, the Bengalis, the whole gamut. But it was beautiful and fantastical, but the real was more compelling. Um, and, and it was also Chris Marker, the great experimental filmmaker who made La Jete, who, I mean, his work really uh, ignited me into believing that one could really make undidactic political art, political film. Bunuel's brutal Los Alvidados was a major precursor to my in later, many years later, making Salam Bombay. It was possible then, I thought, to put life into movies and out again. The elasticity of cinema could create the seesaw of living between worlds as I was beginning to, between East and West. My time at Harvard during the 70s, though, I was struck by people, how much and how many people talked so easily about themselves. They would say things like, I was depressed all summer. And I had never heard an American sentence as dazzling as that. Uh, I thought it was strange, because where I came from, we were raised very much to subsume the self. Uh, the family was bigger than us. The community was bigger than family. And it was not about the self at all. But the academic freedom at Harvard gave me power and some strength, and what I called the foolish confidence of the Ivy League, I see it everywhere in Brown as well, that, that everything possibly is possible. So I felt that it was possible to graduate from college at the age of 21, to write a script, to raise money, to make my own film. 
everybody I lived around had three jobs. We were waitresses at night, we were gallerists during the day, and then we would write proposals. Uh, and, and living this dual life, earning enough money just to live, but living as an artist, uh, everything at least that I thought was about excellence, and it, it wasn't the kind, it wasn't a possible rigor, it wasn't the sort of rigorous life one could have in India. My Punjabi bourgeois family would be much too comfortable, and there wasn't that kind of artistic hunger that I was surrounding myself with uh, to draw on. It would have been so much easier back home to tow the line. But I persisted and made five documentaries over the course of seven years, each exploring questions in India, questions that got under my skin and refused to let me go. First, there was my film So Far From India, where I explored the, bo the borders between countries and people and how one moves in between. And then there was India Cabaret, which I spoke of earlier today, where I questioned the line dividing good women from so-called bad women and the archetypes of saint and whore and mother that we are given or made to play. As an Indian filmmaker in New York City in the 80s, I would ride the Greyhound bus with my documentaries under my arms, showing my films to anyone who would want me. I tolerated audiences who would ask whether there was tap water in India and how come I spoke such good English. I began to understand then the loneliness of being an artist, and the last thing I wanted to do was to be an ambassador of my country in this country. I did not want to be that educator. Um, uh, and, I, and I just wanted to do what, 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 what got under my skin. India was so rarely seen those days, this was the early, late 70s, early 80s, that successful Indians would come to the library where I'd be showing my films and outraged that I showed a film on strippers in India instead of so stories about successful men who drive Porsches like themselves. And they would pretty much attack me and I would say, as soon as a doctor in a Porsche becomes interesting, I'll be right there. Um, Later, raising money for my film, Mississippi Masala, some years later, starring Denzel Washington, a studio head actually asked me to, quote, make room for a white protagonist. And I laughed and said, all the waiters in the film will be white. Uh, I did not keep that promise, but back home, my films were also alternative. <laughs> they, were the, they were the opposite of Bollywood, and I was an outsider. I'd love some water, but I don't see a glass. Um, May I actually have my glass there? Thank you so much. Um, back home, my films were alternative. My own family didn't see my documentaries. Um, my, and the documentaries were barely seen. They were on television, but that appeared to be like a void to me. So I wanted to have more control. I wanted to have a larger audience. I wanted to have the control I did not have in making Cinema Verite, which is the control over the story, over the light, over the gesture, over the storytelling. And my experience in making my first feature film, Salam Bombay, was an amalgamation of these paths that I had traveled. I drew upon my time creating political theater, my roots in documentary, amalgamating my learned skills in uh, cinema verite, uh, adjusting them to create a hybrid form, to make a story with real people, yet a constructed and sculpted narrative, sometimes with known actors, and most times with people who had never faced the camera before. We paid for Salam Bombay with every scam in the book, and uh, we can have a sidebar on scams uh, after this. Um, every night I would raise money for the next day of shooting, essentially. Casting street children in Bombay, my writer Suni Tarapurvala and I worked intimately with a gang of rag pickers for months. We, exp we brought in a workshop of 129 street kids. We whittled them down to 29 kids. All those kids are in the movie, and we worked with them for six to eight weeks in a wonderful dialogue of them educating us about their lives and us bringing uh, yoga, dance, uh, improvisation, and debate to the field so that we could constantly uh, bring, finally, the screenplay of the movie, which had emanated from their, from their lives anyway, back into them. To tell, for them to tell us what is real, what is not, what is authentic. And they would say, Didi, ye sab humko bolne ka. They would not know how to say certain lines that we had concocted, so we were humbled constantly by that dialogue between us, which is pretty much how I have made several films ever since. 
There was no model before Salam Bombay, which allowed me to even imagine that I could have success for such a film, a totally brown film, with the audiences in America or elsewhere. And even in India, those were the years before the multiplexes, those were the years of 1,500 seat huge cinemas where really only multi-star blockbusters prevailed. So there was no place in my thought that we could go. Spike Lee and I are good friends, and we used to share the same editing room in New York City to save money. You pay for 24 hours, he would work for 12, and I would work for 12. And he was finishing She's Gotta Have It, which became a big success. But I never thought an Indian film made in Hindi about kids in Bombay could go down any route like that. There's a simple line in the Bhagavad Gita, beware the fruits of action. Don't tangle with the rewards of your action before you fully bear the fruit of that action. Action, in my thought, sometimes is often contaminated by ambition. Uh, and I went into Salam Bombay with ambition on the side. Uh, I went with a simple attitude to tell the story of the children, to raise the money for it by hook or crook, and to make it to the best of an artistic and political ability, like it is the first and the last day on this earth. Salam Bombay, uh, it was a bit of a fairy tale after the brutal act of making it. It, it won the Camar d'Or in Cannes, it won lots of things, and we went right up to the Academy Awards. But what was really astonishing and amazing for me is that it was the first Indian film really to be commercially sold and seen theatrically across the world in every single country. And the aftermath of that film gave me the energy to believe that we could make a difference in the inequities of the world. With the proceeds of Salam Bombay, we created Salam Balak Trust. Balak, of course, means child. And now it is 33 years old, and it serves more than 5,000 street children every year. So with the Oscar nomination, I had some attention, a lot of agents, uh, lots of offers to make stories of children of every hue. Um, and there's some part of me that has some good sense, and I turned it all down because I had an idea about making a film about being brown between black and white. What I thought of as the hierarchy of color. When I first came here for university, I noticed the levels of difference between black people and Indians and other people of color, the invisible lines and yet the accessibility that I shared between all of them. Growing up in India, it is so deeply apparent, the consciousness we have of degrees of color, of fair, and fair being lovely, of dark being not so lovely, and of color within our own communities. And with coming from that, witnessing it in an American context, the racism really in, in us, in our own communities, uh, in this context, I was deeply intrigued to try and explore it in a fictional way. The Asian expulsion by Idi Amin pro provided the hook to this story. In 1972, Idi Amin expelled all Asians from Uganda several generations at once. These were Indians who thought of Africa as home, but created an India there, leading a life very separate from the local African society. Now they had been turned upon by Africans and asked to leave. What happens to them then? What is home for them? It seemed to me that this was one point in history where this kind of tension between black and brown races had crystallized. I also read of these same Ugandan Indian exiles who came to dirt poor Mississippi and bought motels there, especially there in the Deep South. Again, it was intriguing to me that this was where they would end up owning them, given the history of segregation in the South. So once again, just as in Uganda, Indians were in the middle of black and white. So I put the two realities together. What would happen if one person from the Indian community crossed the border of color into another, the black one? The story of Mississippi Masala is an interracial love story which, when discovered, explodes. And the love story brings back memories of the exodus from Uganda. I brought this idea to my old friend uh, and my close friend, Suni Tarapurwala, who had written the screenplay for Salam Bombay. She made it really come alive. It's an irreverent kind of a comedy about exile and race. Our characters speak in a way that would be virtually unsayable in today's hold of political correctness. It's a mischievous film. While it holds a mirror to all sorts of racism within our communities, we managed to pack in, I think, a lot of fun amidst the searing truths. When I think about the South, it uh, is on the surface a very cordial coexistence. The Indians kept a professional distance between the whites and the blacks. The black people often called them brother, and it was reciprocated to some extent, but the lines were clearly drawn. 
I once met an Indian man who told me, oh, we are just white people who stayed in the sun too long. Um, but there was no sense of real alignment with one or the other. The Indians learned to play the game. And the motel culture so easily lent itself to an Indian ethos, the family, working, living, earning together, and a self-sufficient universe, but hilarious, because this hil traditional Indian universe was butted against local trysts, prostitutes, all kinds of action. The, the situation was unique, hybrid, and therefore the title of masala. There were two challenges. One was to make the black universe in the film as complicated and real as I know the Indian one to be. I was greatly assisted by the consummate skill of the fabulous black cast, Denzel Washington, Joe Seneca, Charlie Dutton. And the locale of Greenwood, where we shot the film, where coincidentally Stokely Carmichael had coined the phrase black power, uh, the second challenge was blending the totally different acting traditions that all these actors come from. We had Indian soap opera stars, we had Indian screen legends like Sharmila Tagore, we had Roshan Sait, an Indian actor classically trained in England, and Denzel from Hollywood, and Sarita Chowdhury, a young Bangladeshi girl who had never faced the camera before. What is astonishing is that while they are different, the similarity of how an Indian family lives and how a black family in the South lived, in terms of the community, the family, the religion, are very similar. For the first time, to see ourselves in both communities, not just see ourselves as the other. Because so many of our notions were born out of ignorance and not knowing and precon preconceptions which have nothing to do with the essence. It's like the little prince who said, the essence is invisible to the eye. There is a necessary yet, there's a necessary yet terrible loneliness in being amongst the first of your kind. As I pushed forward with no example or guru, I didn't know whether I would even find an audience to meet me on the other side of my work. The feeling of being neither here nor there, a novelty at home, a foreigner abroad, was hard to shake off. When Mississippi Masala opened in London, in New York, and all over the place, I remember looking at the queues of people lined around the block to see it. And I delighted at not only the sheer number, but also the color, the lines of people flashing their hybridity with pride. It was then I discovered that there are people who are listening. I believe really that there's nothing more powerful than making work in which we see ourselves, in which we hear and look at our color, our language, our poetry, to make work that brims with specificity and plums something relatable in each one of us. <clears throat> My next, I mean, I made several films, but my film Monsoon Wedding came out of a challenge I gave myself to make something out of nothing. I was living in South Africa then. Apartheid was declared over. Mandela was out of prison. Yet nothing around me existed in terms of training in cinema for the black, Asian, or colored townships that I lived nearby but was not in. I gathered 26 young people from the townships with the idea that it was possible to make something out of nothing so long as we could preserve and give flower to our own imaginations. And then I asked myself after this teaching, could I do the same thing? Could I, after having bigger budgets and Hollywood studio movies, return to the same credo that I was preaching? So I moved closer to home with Monsoon Wedding, specifically examining the much beloved family that we also venerate. As much as a family gives us joy and solace, we also have our secrets. There are subjects that are taboo to speak of the top amongst them being sexual abuse within the family. I strove to provide some catharsis of liberation for those who had been abused and really the more one discussed that, the more apparent and common that was. Above all, of course, I wanted in Monsoon Wedding to capture a reality check on what our real family weddings are like, not the Bollywood version, which was great fun, but nothing to do with the madness around my own family when weddings happened. For me, it was about love. It worked, I think, because we were honest. And, and, and because it was so inexpensive, I made it for under a million bucks, uh, I didn't have to answer to anyone. Uh, and it's the low budget, I always believe, that gives one freedom. And in fact, Monsoon Wedding was so low budget that uh, props, furniture, saris, cutlery, everything came from our homes. Uh, my, if you talk to Nasiruddin Shah, who's in the film, or you talk to Kulbushan Kharbanda, who's in the film, they don't talk about how much fun they had 
while making the film, they talk about my mother's food. She catered the film. And, and she, they say, ha, ha, you are OK, but your mother's okra is incomparable. So you know, it was that kind of an artisanal, they would call it today, homemade movie. Um, and we limited the filming to just 30 days, because that was the amount of money that we had raised. But because we knew, I think, because we knew what we were doing, and we created a sense of a real family, um, uh, you know, again, putting legends like Nasir opposite unknowns like my own nephew, and oftentimes the crew was acting in the film because actors would not show up. Um, uh, you know, the, the, it had a kind of energy that I did not anticipate. By then, I recognized, after Monsoon Wedding came out, the privilege of inspiration. Uh, the next chapter of my filmmaking journey was fueled in contrast by grief. I lost a parent in a country which was not home. And I read in this moment the, the beautiful book that Jhumpa Lahiri had written, The Namesake. The book became a real comfort to me, a source of solace, uh, as I tried making sense of the finality of loss. And she, she, her writing distilled this nature of grief, the loss of a parent that is, that is in a country that the parent did not really know taking readers through a world of crisscrossings that were achingly familiar. The film became about the passage of life that everyone has to lead, that we are linked to our parents who are linked to their parents, that our parents' world begin to enter our world when we are wise enough to receive it. Unbeknownst to me, a young man who grew up in New Jersey and saw the Indian word masala on the marquees of theaters in his hometown, New Jersey, realized that he too could be an actor. This was Cal Penn, who had recently found big success in the comedy Harold and Kumar Go to White Castle. Uh, and my son and several 14-year-olds that I knew at that time <laughs> led me to cast him in his first dramatic role in The Namesake, opposite Irfan Khan and Tabu. The namesake was many of my worlds, the Calcutta I left behind as a teenager, the Cambridge where I went to college, and New York where I now live. Yet I never felt the pull to shoot a film in New York until I read Jhumpa's story. William Thackeray writes in Vanity Fair, the world is a looking glass and gives to every man the reflection of his own face. New York was my looking glass, and in making the namesake, I could show the world the ease and confidence of the new South Asian cool in the city, how the Desi Demi Mond really lived here, a New York that had not yet made its way to screen. Jhumpa's New York was not the immigrant communities of Little India or Jackson Heights, but the New York of lofts, of Ivy League bonding, of art galleries, political marches, openings, country weekends in Maine with waspy friends, a deeply cos cosmopolitan place with its own images and manners. This was the place I had lived in since 1979, this is the city in which I learned how to see. The more I thought about it, the more I felt these two great cities of the world, New York and Calcutta, mirrored each other in specific ways. The massive steel of the Howrah Bridge, like an iconic sash across the Ganges, was echoed in the light grace of the George Washington Bridge across the Hudson River outside my window. I scouted a, ho a hospital on Roosevelt Island and felt it might easily have been a hospital in Calcutta. Ashima could give birth to Gogol here, I thought. She could look out of the window and in the girders of the Queensboro Bridge, the shake and hum of traffic above and below would lie the ghost of the Howrah. That is, of course, the state of being of many of us who live between worlds, a state that I think cinema does beautiful justice to. One of the great advantages of living in three continents, as I do, is that one begins to have an expansive worldview. What is important in one place is absolutely meaningless in the other place. The aspirations of being a filmmaker in New York City, the studio deals, the academy campaigns that elude my own films forever for more mainstream films are quickly put in place when I go home to Kampala, which does not, did not even have movie theaters until only a few years ago. This shifting of gears from one reality to another makes me hone my own intuition to trust the ideas that live in me. When I moved to live in Uganda in the early 90s, despite the richest tradition of oral storytelling there, there was hardly a movie being made by Africans in the continent. Because I had an ankle in Hollywood, the new films about Africa came my way to direct. 
The film may have been set in Kenya, but it was really about an English woman who unraveled in her neuroses as an unnamed, voiceless, nameless Maasai warrior stood sculpturally against the African horizon. Absolutely nothing to do with the world that I lived around, the dignity and the courtesy of the people and the culture that I knew. Using a Swahili word, Maisha, the zest for life, our, we created a free film school in East Africa, and we gave birth to that 16 years ago. It was back to the old mantra, if we don't tell our own stories, no one else will, and if they do, pardon my French, they will bugger it. For the 16 years, uh, we have now created a base of about 1,000 plus alumni of East African filmmakers, trained at the highest level of craft in every facet of filmmaking. Several of our Maisha alumni, now accomplished filmmakers, joined me to make the Disney film, Queen of Katwe, in 2015. This film told the remarkable story of Fiona Mutesi, a true story, a young woman in Uganda, a young girl, who learned to play chess and become a woman candidate master at the World Chess Olympiads. As my favorite line in Queen of Katwe goes, such aggressiveness in a girl is a national treasure. I relished in celebrating not only my home of Uganda, where I have lived for many years, close to 30, but also the brilliance and ten of tenacious and fierce young women like Fiona everywhere. Those who are never satisfied, those who do not accept limitations, who create their own paths, forging from them nothing in the face of stagnancy. I'm lucky enough to live in Kampala for half the year. The line of equator genuinely and seriously runs through my garden. Uh, in our film school, Maisha, we, uh, we, I have created, you know, every student and every teacher will plant a tree and has planted a tree in their name. Uh, to my design. Someone called it an eco-reserve of African cinema. Uh, trees, I believe, are glorious witnesses to our passage. For long as I can remember, I thought I would share with you that my secret life has been nourished by trees. In a, in a life bringing with, uh, brimming with the chaos of questions and noise, these silent creatures bring, bring me peace, simply listening in a world that is otherwise fueled by clamor. I sense that people and places speak, that places speak for themselves, that each is unique. Like my landscape guru, Roberto Burley Marx uh, from Brazil, I, I, like, I try to learn on how to capture the spirit of a place, discover the dominant lines of its topography, the mysterious undercurrents of light and sun, and I defer to them to create the garden, much like a composer, in harmony with the landscape. I practice gorilla planting or guerrilla planting in Kampala. I put trees in the soil anywhere I can, in slums, on public roads, in cemeteries, on dirt-ridden paths. Like another teacher who taught me how to see, the great French photographer, Cartier Bresson, I, I share a passion for geometry and the joy of being surprised by a beautiful organization of forms. It is in this way that the subject or the landscape takes on all of its scope and significance. To keep ourselves alive in our world, it is essential to stand in the unknown, to embrace the monsoon of uncertainty. In order to make anything happen and then happen again, I try to cultivate stamina. I try to keep the heart of a poet alive in me, but goddess knows I have to maintain the skin of an elephant. Do we have the courage to write our own story, or will we watch as they write it for us? So the struggle continues, and I tell myself as I embark recently on another lonely road trying to convince the market to finance my new film on Amrita Shergill, the unsung pioneering painter from 100 years ago, the, the mother and father of Frida Kahlo from our part of the world, uh, that I'm not supposed to follow this market. I'm not supposed to follow it. I'm supposed to push the market. Because there is no market for an all-black film about a young girl who plays chess. You don't make that film if you're following the market. You make that film, you hope the market will catch up. Uh, Queen of Katwe, by the way, led to the Queen's Gambit, that then chess was in the mainstream news. But even then, in the mainstream news, I was very happy to see that Garry Kasparov, the great chess champion, was quoted as saying as, that the best chess movie ever made was Queen of Katwe. <laughs> but, uh, you know, so there is still no market right now. I, I was rejected 
early this morning when a big, uh, from a big studio. Uh, there is no market right now for a story about a half Hungarian, half Punjabi woman pioneering painter, Amrita. She's quite renowned, but not globally famous. So in other words, I don't look to the market to figure out which stories I should tell. I tell the stories the market will not tell. I try to push the boundary. Because of all the work that so many have done, the work now that I have done in the past is being looked at with new eyes, being appreciated for what it was. We are recently re-releasing the 30th anniversary of Mississippi Masala, newly remastered and remixed in the theaters in three months from now. But I cannot let that make me feel complacent or comfortable because so much of Hollywood is about recreating what has already been successful, but just changing the face of it. Same structure, but with a brown actor. There is importance in telling universal stories, but we also must tell our stories our way. We have to live with both worlds. They have to catch up and meet us. Because I have told stories sometimes where people have caught up. Sometimes I'll tell story that uses the language and idea and plot structure that most mainstream is familiar with. But for whatever capital I get from that, I reinvest it into challenging stories that do not fit this mold into this world of thinking. I could actually go for as far to say that if everyone is ready for the story I wish to tell, maybe it's not actually the story that needs to be told. This is not to gl glorify struggle or glorify rejection. But, but if you're finding yourself with every door open to you that everyone thinks is the perfect story to work the algorithms that be, then it might not be challenging enough. So you have to push yourself because so much of what people want to see is what they are safe and happy with seeing. And so much of the reason that the world is in the state it's in is because people are refusing to see beyond things that they are afraid of seeing, because they have told themselves that, this, that that is a completely different story. We need to challenge the idea that brown being fashionable now, that's only a certain kind of brown, brown that fits into the existing structure. So people say representation matters. Oh, so now we have a Desi FBI agent who's investigating terrorists. But for me, that is so transparent and not enough. Representation to me, being fashionable now, cannot let it make us believe that all of us are fashionable. The entirety of me is not fashionable. Right now, what may be in vogue is the surface of us. We have to make sure that we don't leave the depth behind when we are telling that story, so that it's not just the same story, but her name happens to be Meena or his Rakesh. Now Meena gets the guy, and perhaps he's just a few shades darker than he was 20 years ago. But to challenge ourselves to ask who of the brown is fashionable now? Is it the palatable brown? Why can it not be the Dalit brown or the queer brown? They called me Pugly, that's my nickname, Mad Girl, when I was growing up. And there is little anyone can learn from a mad girl. But I do know that in the creative world, borders by necessity need to be fluid and porous. More than ever today, I think it is time for us to tell stories in which people can see themselves and not just some people, but all people. Not just some places, but everywhere. Because it takes courage, really, to be original, especially for those who have been told for the past few centuries that the West is the mirror in which they can see their future. It has always been time for our stories, but now is the time we will make them our way. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Mira, for that um, extraordinary lecture. We will have uh, <coughs> time for uh, Q&A uh, after our discussions. Um, so it's my um, great pleasure to introduce our first discussant. Um, Karan Mahajan is a, a novelist, essayist, and critic. He was uh, born I believe, in Stamford, Connecticut, and raised in New Delhi. Uh, he studied English and economics at Stanford University before receiving an MFA from the Missioner Center for Writers of the University of Texas at Austin, 
widely regarded as one of the top creative um, writing programs in the world. Mahajan's first novel, Family Planning, was published to enormous acclaim in 2008 and, and universally praised for its exemplary comedic worldview. Uh, the novel has translations current and completed into German, Italian, Spanish, French, Portuguese, and Korean. Uh, Karan Mahajan's second novel, The Association of Small Bombs, appeared in 2016 to numerous laudations, awards, and nominations. Um, the New York Times named this novel one of its 10 best books of 2016. Um, Mahajan's occasional writing has appeared in prestigious venues like the New York Times, the New York Review of Books, Vanity Fair, The New Yorker, The New Republic, uh, amongst others. Uh, he is, I'm proud and delighted to say, assistant professor in literary arts at Brown University. Karan. Um, thank you so much for that introduction, Leela. Uh, and Mira, thank you for uh, a terrific lecture, one that, to my mind, recreates the warmth, optimism, mischief, and complexity of your movies. Um, several phrases really struck out to me. One was, of course, the red oxide veranda of the Bhubaneshwar Club, uh, and of course, the way you mischievously substituted pure gibberish for your homework instead of words. Uh, you know, I can totally see the DNA of your lively style and those kinds of images. Um, but before I um, respond to the lecture, I just wanted to say here that I come here uh, not as a scholar or as a novelist, but as a fan, as someone whose own family life has closely tracked uh, Mira's oeuvre. I remember mo watching Monsoon Wedding before attending an almost identical Punjabi bourgeois wedding in my own family, complete with the creepy uncle. And I believe she did for creepy uncles what Dickens did for the smog in London, made it impossible to unsee creepy uncles. Um, I remember watching the namesake in a theater in Delhi with my parents and coming out, all three of us, with tears in our eyes, watching the Kama Sutra late at night on the cable operator's illegal channel when everyone else was asleep. Um, and I also want to tell you about the first time I, uh, the first and only time really I've met Mira before this, um, to give you a sense of what she's like as a person. Um, this was a few years ago at a, at a densely packed party in uh, the Manhattan home of an Italian filmmaker and writer. I have no idea what I was doing there, but someone introduced me to Mira and I was gushing to her in a fanboyish way. But it was also very hot and airless uh, at this party. And I'd had a bit too much to drink, I had a stomach infection, and in the middle of a sentence I said, Mira, look, I'm, I'm so sorry, but I think I'm going to faint. So um, I made a beeline for the bar to get some water, and Mira very kindly started following me to see how she could help. And um, as it happened, I fainted on top of the great Mira Nair. Um, so into her arm. Uh, so I literally fainted the first time I met Mira, is the, is the moral of the story. Luckily, Mira survived. Um, I survived too. And um, the next thing I knew, I had been transported to this bedroom in the back of this uh, house. And I was lying on a plateau of winter jackets. And Mira was sitting with me and just holding my hand and talked to me for the next 30 or 40 minutes instead of going back to the party. She answered all my questions. Well, she asked me a lot about myself, but then she also answered all my questions about filmmaking, how she's handled a long distance relationship over three continents, um, how one makes films when one is divided between so many places. And she would also point out all the celebrities who would come in and out to pick up jackets. At one point, there was a sweet old lady with white hair who asked what was going on. And when she left, Mira said, oh, do you know who that was? And I said, no, I have no idea. She said, that's Erica Jong, uh, you know, of the zipless fuck. Um, and after all that was uh, over, uh, in, Mira actually very kindly dropped me home. So this is just an example to give you a sense of Mira's natural warmth, generosity, and interest in people. Um, I was by far the least famous person there. And also her ability to create pauses of profundity in the middle of, in the middle of raucous celebrations. Her movies for me enact this movement, if you think of Monsoon Wedding or Mississippi Masala, 
between the oppressive pleasure of community and the necessity of self-discovery and self-expression, but without stating outright that either pole is bad or good. Uh, Rewatching Mississippi Masala the other day, I was struck by how she can capture joy in all the communities she portrays, Southern, Blacks, transplanted, Indians, Ugandans, in Kampala. This is far harder, I think, in literature and in film than one realizes. It requires a kind of expansive vision and omniscience. It is easy, I think, to take phrases like exile, interracial strife, and expulsion and craft a grim narrative from them. Grimness, brown grimness in particular, has always been in fashion. But to show these worlds as co-equal spaces, rotating on the axes of their own traditions, and occasionally grating against each other and throwing off sparks, requires a certain kind of originality, which I believe is Mira Nair's genius. And this is where I want to segue now into the subject of today's lecture uh, on being brown before it was fashionable. Um, the lecture really presents uh, to us a picture of a woman full of unworldly energy, carefully observing where she is. Uh, if she's in New York City, she asks herself, well, how did this Gujarati newspaper vendor on the 116th Street station get there? What does his life in India look like? How, does, how do the two worlds coexist in his head? When she's in Bombay, she inquires, what are the lives of the street children like? And back in America, she wonders, how did so many Ugandan Indians end up in Mississippi? What impresses me um, is how boldly, from the beginning, for a woman who grew up in India, Mira was able to shrug off labels that might have been imposed on her by others and also by, on herself, by herself. Uh, as a writer myself who has come from India, it can be a struggle to stop thinking of myself as just a person who writes about India and to actually look directly at the place I'm in to see how I'm implicated by the world I inhabit, whether that's in the US or uh, in Africa or in, elsewhere in South Asia. Mira, it seems to me, instinctively understood that the movement of people around the world, of which she herself was a part, was a big subject, even if others didn't recognize it as such. And in this, she resembles um, two other uh, great artists uh, of transplantation, Salman Rushdie, who was here the other day, and, and also V.S. Naipaul. Um, but seeing a subject and finding a form are two very different things. And there's a modesty, I think, in Mira's lecture about her mastery of the craft of storytelling. Um, again, I'll speak about this from the perspective of a novelist. One of the great difficulties of writing about Indians in the US is that there isn't the same charged colonial relationship between Indian and US history as there is, for example, between British and Indian history. And so it, it's no real surprise that there's a fuller body um, of literature about Indians in Britain than there is about Indians in America. Mira, in a movie like Mississippi Masala, found a way to demonstrate that the intersection between Indians and blacks in the US wasn't happening in an all-American racial vacuum that it might actually have a historical analog or a distorted reflection in, say, the interactions of Indians and black Africans on the African mainland. Nor is the displacement of Indians in that movie unique. The movie is full of Indians who have never been to India and Africans or African Americans who have never been to Africa. So what could be a weightless story of an immigrant finding love in the US becomes a vessel for many clanging colliding novel histories. There is, of course, also the sheer boldness of the subject matter, uh, which Mira spoke about. Um, I can't imagine, for example, a producer in the 1980s or today leaping up from his bed and saying, you know what, I must make a movie about African Indians in the American South. Um, in fact, as a character says in the movie, uh, how come they got Indians in Africa? I would wager that despite all the talk today in the US about brownness and blackness, most educated Americans, for example, don't know about these particular stripes of brownness. Um, so some of what she's done with her films is uh, to achieve what Saul Bellow says a story should do, which is to open the universe a little bit. She has talked in, in her lecture today about the necessity, yet terrible loneliness, of being one of the first to attempt such stories, of creating the ground she stands upon. But what's amazing to me is that when Mira projects 
this self into her movies, into her narratives, she creates protagonists who are firsts. There's Mina in Mississippi Masala crossing the color line uh, for her love affair, or Rhea in Monsoon Wedding speaking out against sexual violence. But these people who are firsts are not just individuals on grim, alienated journeys. They remain part of a community and are often even comfortable in their own skins. This seems to me a reflection of Mira's own attitudes, of the, of, the, of the comfort she seems to feel in her own skin wherever she goes. Mira Nair is a person who has left many places, but has left nothing about them behind. Um, so it's a real pleasure to hear her talk today. Thank you, Mira. Uh, oh, thank you, uh, Kiran. That was absolutely lovely. Um, and now um, I'm delighted to uh, welcome uh, Ashish Avikuntaka, uh, who is a cultural anthropologist and visionary filmmaker whose exquisite oeuvre of feature films and short films has been aptly described as follows. And I quote, in an art world where an increasing number of critics are arguing that much globalized art takes the form of hollowed out visual Esperanto, Avikuntak's works insist on an Indian epistemology while utilizing a rigorously formal visual language that is clearly aware of Western avant-garde practices such as those of Andrei Tarkovsky and Samuel Beckett. These are self-consciously difficult works that are filmed in a self-consciously beautiful way." Unquote. Um, Avi Kuntaka's films have uh, shown across the world in locations such as Tate Modern, uh, London, the uh, Georges Pompidou Center in Paris, the Taipei Biennale, the Shanghai Biennale, the Pacific Film Archive in Berkeley, uh, along with London, Locarno, Rotterdam, and Berlin Film Festival. Uh, retrospectives of his works have screened at, uh, in, in Berlin, in, in Croatia, in Athens, um, in this country, in India, um, um, and in 2011, he was shortlisted for the Skoda Prize for Indian Contemporary Art. In 2014, he was named Future Great by Art Review. Avi Kuntak is also a critic with scholarly publications in leading journals, uh, venues, such as Contributions to Indian Sociology, um, Indian Economic and Social History Review, a Journal of Material Culture, Journal of Social Archaeology, and The Moving Image. He has a PhD in cultural and social anthropology from Stanford University uh, and has taught at Yale. Uh, he is uh, associate professor in film and media at the Harrington School of Communication at the University of Rhode Island. I'm delighted to welcome him to this forum. Thank you, uh, Leela. Uh, it's, it's such a pleasure uh, to speak about Mira uh, here. Uh, I've known Mira for a few years, and uh, what I'm going to read out is not a response directly to this lecture, but to what I imagine Mira's body of work to be. Uh, this is a kind of a very personal reflection as a cinephile, which is what I'm going to read. I distinctively remember the day when I first came across Mira's work. It was a dusky, rainy, and a rather miserable afternoon in Calcutta in 1988. Instead of attending my dreaded high school math tuition class, I decided to skip it and escaped to Nondom, the majestic temple of cinephilia in Calcutta. For a young high school cinephile like me, this was a sacred site where you undertake daily pilgrimage 
to have a darshan of your gods on the silver screen. Nandan was one of the first cinema theaters in India to exclusively showcase international art house cinema and Indian parallel cinema. Films of Igmar Bergman, Michelangelo Antonioni, Jola Godard, Akira Kurosawa, robustly rubbed shoulders with the works of Satyajit Ray, Mrinal Shen, Riti Ghatok, Gautam Ghosh, G. Arvindan, and many others. That gloomy afternoon, I was literally blown by the intense, tenacious, and obstinate realism of Salam Bombay in the monumental theater on a glistening and pristine 35 millimeter print. By the monsoon of 1988, Salam Bombay was already in news. Meera Nair was the first Indian filmmaker to win the prestigious Camera d'Or at Cannes Film Festival for the best first feature film. This was unambiguously the most spectacular cinematic debut in the history of Indian cinema after Satyajit Ray's Othir Machali at Khan in 1955. The parallel between the two films doesn't end here. Othir Machali was more hyper neorealist than its Italian neorealistic counterparts of the 1950s, then Salam Bombay was more hyper realist than the political realism of the Indian parallel cinema. If the trials, tribulations, and tragedy of Opu spoke tenderly to us as an anguished metaphor for both what it meant to be a despondent individual struggling with fate and also what it meant to be a young nation emerging from the brutality of, of colonialism and the insanity of partition. Then Salam Bombay, with its relentless, gritty, realistic, and overwhelming savage depiction of Bombay's street life, spoke sharply to us through the precarity of street children, prostitute, destitutes of what India had become after more than 40 years of independence. In my cinephilic consciousness, the cinematic precarity of Opu and Krishna had merged into a single continuum of a post-colonial gignosis of a tragic Indian destiny. Over the years, I have seen Salam Bombay numerous times, and most recently on Mubi, the Netflix-like web platform for international art house cinema. It does not fail to awe me even now. In the early 1990s, as an undergraduate student social worker, the daily realities of walking in the streets of Kamatipura, the derelict, salacious, and teeming working class red light district of Bombay was constantly mediated for me with the cinematic reality that Mira recreated in the film. Every street corner of Falkland Road, Grant Road, Bindi Mazar, Mazgao, locations where the films were shot reminded me of the astute accuracy of Salam Bombay. It is not that every frame of the film conjured the reality of Bombay's agitated street life, but it is that everyday reality of this rapacious Bombay neighborhood resonated with the formidable frames of the film. The impact of Salam Bombay was penetratingly ontological for me. Punjabi weddings, Punjabi culture has been a staple for Bollywood even before it was deified with the sardonic nomenclature. Popular Hindi cinema from the days of Punjabi stalwarts like Raj Kapoor, Devanan, Dilip Kumar were obsessed with the festive opulence of Punjabi weddings, which touch obscenely grotesque heights in films made by the Chopras and the Johars of Bollywood at the cusp of the 21st century. This was a meta-cinematic tropology of Hindi cinema that I never thought would ever be breached or dislodged, till I saw a monsoon wedding one night in a multiplex theater populated by South Asian diaspora in Fremont, California in 2001. 
Here was a cinematic text that masterfully and effortlessly but piercingly destroyed the facade of diegetic conjugality carefully constructed over more than 50 years of melodramatic theatrics of Hindi cinema. As a Punjabi from Calcutta who cautiously avoided and bitterly hated family weddings in the Punjabi heartland of Delhi, where most of my extended family had relocated after partition, monsoon wedding powerfully spoke to me in ways that were overwhelmingly closer to my subjectivity. I was all too familiar with petty domestic politics, inglorious stories of familial deceit, Candlestein stories of marital abuse and daily oppression that was scrupulously concealed behind the fake opulence of triumphant matrimony. Indian weddings are usually lavish and joyous affairs, but often lurking under the marigold flowers Banarsi silk saris, nohalakka necklaces, and dazzling, dazzling cuisine is the sordid world of interpersonal hatred, financial exploitation, and often dread of lifelong servitude. <laughs> Monsoon wedding with its ensemble cast deftly directed by Mira for the first time in the history of cinema gave us an animated glimpse of what that messy underbelly of upper middle class Indian families look like. What Salam Bombay did to the ruthless street life of Bombay monsoon wedding did that to the ostentious Indian wedding. Like all timeless text, both the films produced an astonishingly honest simulacrum of our lived realities through which I could see a mirror image of what we had become as a society, as a culture, and more importantly for me, as a civilization, fraudulent, brutal, and deceitful on many levels. Perhaps this critique is too harsh, but for me, the brilliance of these films by Mira lies in their ability to slowly, cautiously, and surgically peel open a world of wounds and trauma that reminded me of the works of the cinematic god who resides at the center of my altar, Ritik Ghatok. Finally, I want to speak about the film that brings together the two diverse universes that I now occupy. The exuberantly hot, humid, crowded world of Calcutta and the empty, reticent serenity of Rhode Island in one single narrative. Mira's namesake via Jhumpa Lahiri's book is a film that when I saw in 2006 in a cinema theater near Stanford University foretold my future written in the past that I was yet to live. Not Gogol, the central protagonist of the film, but it was Ashok Ganguly, his soft-spoken and affectionate father brilliantly played by late Irfan Khan that struck an unusual chord when I saw the film for the first time. I did not understand what that chord meant. As a matter of fact, I ignored the supple melancholia as a product of compelling affective universe of Mira's creativity. It was a few years later <clears throat> when I joined University of Rhode Island in 2010 as an assistant professor of film and media that I realized what the placid resonance of that melancholic chord meant to me. One winter morning in front of the main library of URI in its historic Kingston campus, I met, I met the octogenarian Professor Omar Lahiri, who even after his retirement would visit his office every day. He was Jumpa Lahiri's father and the inspiration of Ashok Ganguly. As we spoke in Bengali, in the glimmer of his eyes, I saw my lonesome future permanently located in the wintry melancholia of New England, with a heart always pining for the warm, muggy, boisterous, polluted life of Calcutta, which always gives me a stern knock of bronchial asthma within minutes after I land. 
What Mira stunningly creates in namesake is such a far cry from the tenacious realism of Bombay street life or repugnant secrets of Punjabi families like mine. In this film, she again, with a perceptive dexterity, opens forgotten wounds, untold trauma of a world of metaphysical loneliness that I believe only a first-time immigrant like herself, as we heard today, who has lived a life away from one's own homeland can represent. In this film, I found the forlorn lives of Ashok Ganguly and Gogol merging with mine and my daughter's life in a future that is yet to arrive, but in which we live, survive, and struggle because it is our present too. Before I end, I want to thank you, Mira, from one filmmaker to another for inspiring me to make films that summon an imagination of affective realities that we experience every day without being aware of their penetrating intrusions into our existence. And secondly, I want to thank you as a lifelong cinephile for weaving an evocative web of rigorous imagery, images, mesmerizing, mesmerizing narratives, and an affective world that has been gingerly sealed with the memories of my being forever. Thank you. Well, after that absolutely <laughs> exquisite <laughs> hour and some, uh, I'm uh, very glad to uh, open the floor. Um, to, to questions, to reflections, to encomia. Uh, um, Should we ask up here? Should we ask up yeah, here? Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, Arnav. Arnav. And I, I will introduce Arnav and Tamari English, but those whom I don't know, please, uh, please introduce yourself as you come to the mic. Um, thank you so much for, for your lecture. Um, that was lovely. And, and also the responses, I think, just uh, were really kind of poignant. And it, it's clear how kind of personal your work is for a lot of us, actually. Um, Ashish, your, you know, your thought on the namesake, you know, the day Irfan Khan died, actually, the first film I watched of his, despite his like kind of tremendous oeuvre, was the namesake. I think for Karan, you mentioned the joy that Mira's films bring. I think the melancholy in that film is also just so specific. Um, that I couldn't think of watching anything else. Um, but actually, my question um, for you was related to something you mentioned earlier on in your in your life in terms of your interest in Grotowski mm -hmm. and the kind of group theater. Um, you know, a lot of, we've talked a lot, you, you mentioned the kind of energy of the crew in, in Monsoon Wedding, for example. You talked about the combination of actors and non-actors, which of course was a hallmark of a lot of cinema verite as well. Um, and you know, there's also the theatrical nature of your work in a lot of different ways in, in, in the kinds of ways that it's set up. So I wanted to ask you about how kind of theater interacts with your work and specifically, you know, you're known for your work with ensembles as well. I would say, you know, you didn't mention um, a suitable boy in detail, yeah. but I think a lot of that is about the ensemble. So I just want to talk about the interactions between group theater and the ensemble in your work. Thank you, thank you. Um, I come, I mean, resolutely from the theater. I should have said that more, perhaps, but um, I, I, I thought that was what I was going to do, is just the theater. And it's funny, I, I meant to also tell you that I spent the last 12 years making Monsoon Wedding a big musical that is going to open. Uh, in, it was going to open in 2020, but the pandemic hit, but now it's opening in 2023 um, in, in, in New York. So. Um, it, it makes, I, I feel at home in the theater, in fact. Uh, and I, st I went from, you know, studying from Badada to like for solid four or five years just being on stage and then being an actor in a very versatile space that sometimes we created our work, but most times it was also, you know, from Shakespeare to Jean-Claude Van Italy or, or whatever. And when I came to America, it was to be an actor. Uh, it was to be an actor, but in Harvard at the time there was no, credit for theater, so I used to study at La Mama, not study, work in, in an experimental theater where, in fact, I met the group theater, uh, and I met Judith Molina, I met Jim Beck, I met, and I worked with Joseph Chaikin, and I worked with 
later uh, not worked with but observed and hung with Peter Brook, as well as Elizabeth Suedos, who was making The Runaways at the time, uh, which then became in many ways like almost a seed that allowed me many years later to make Salam Bombay in that same way that she had originally worked. So, so the ensemble, it's the circus, right? Theater is always that way, and but it's so many other skills, but the circus of the ensemble, I think was planted in me in retrospect through the theater. Um, I, I, um, the only thing was that I just would tire of not having any control over how I was seen, what we did, there was no, an actor, you're a tool in the hands of the larger thing, you know, and that used to, uh, I used to chaff with that, you know, I used to, I thought I couldn't just be in the mercy of other people's visions, you know, that was what the only conflict was. And later it was because the college didn't credit it, so I had to find another way to, to study, which became filmmaking. But the theater is, there is nothing for me that duplicates the theater in the sense of the electricity of the ephemeral, like what you see, you will never see again. <laughs> uh, actually, Broadway kind of tuning is not like that. I've discovered it's very much about perfecting it and being absolutely specific because it's about the music and the performance and the timing and the light. It's almost like film live, you know. Um, but I love the ephemeral. I love the fact that you, the electricity of what you see then, you won't see again. And it's, in, the, in a sense, for me, a deeply yogic act, you know, that idea of what is important now is meaningless in a second from now, in a sense. So I love, I love that, and, and, and it takes me there each time. Um, yes, I did, I did study Grotowski very, very closely in my later teens, like 18, 19, 20. And it was a little terrifying in its austerity, you know. But my best friend, Khaled Tayabji, uh, who we started in the theater together, he went and studied, he went and lived with Grotowski for years, you know. And I used to get whatever I could from him about it, but it was just, the austerity was just like numbing, you know. I couldn't do it, I couldn't do it for myself, I think. I think I did graduate always towards the, uh, towards the circus, towards the ensemble, and what Cinema Verite gave me was an ability to use that all together into a form that then became fiction and, and documentary in a way combined. But it was the theater always from the beginning. And now, with now coming back, we'll open in November 22, uh, the, the play, and then we'll come to New York in June 23. Uh, it, it's back on the theater and it is, it is not a scary universe, but it is a kind of, uh, it's like making films without a secure safety net, you know, because you never know <laughs> what will happen. And you're really working with everyone in flesh and blood alive right there in front of you. And there's nothing to beat that. This was such a treat, really. Thank you. And thank you, Karan. Ashish, that was beautiful. Um, and uh, I think it really kind of speaks to just how powerful your movies have been for so many of us. And I think how important it has been for you to be telling the stories before it was cool to be brown. Um, and it's not just, you know, it's, it's so, so much of it. I think of characters, you know, I think of the lame prince in Kama Sutra. Like, I mean, that's even in a movie that, that you was know, Khalid. That was exactly my best friend. Khalid. Khalid. You know, so I think of the lame prince. I think of Ria, the creepy uncle. You know, you think of the kids. It's it's so it's in you. You know, um, you think of even like you know songs in it, like Chunari Chunari in Monsoon Wedding. It's uh, my question was, you know, you have worked so deftly um, with. But for me, two kinds of forms. So one is the kind of Mississippi masala, and you spoke about this in your responses to questions uh, on Monday, is this kind of ethnographic form, mm -hmm. right? Like kind of really immersing yourself um, in Salam Bombay, the way that you described it in Mississippi masala, going and living with Suni Darporwala mm -hmm. um, in Uganda, in Mississippi. And then on the other hand, you have also, and this to me is kind of unusual and perhaps unique, is then you then do these masterful, I, I wouldn't even call them like adaptations, but just you make them your own, right? Like so Jumpa Lahiri's uh, and Vikram Seth's. 
And so, but you do them both kind of bringing, bringing a very distinctive visual language and affect. And I'm just wondering, you know, in a way it builds on Aru's question of like, you know, where does theater, how does theater come in? To me, the question is how do you do these two very distinct things of really working on the script in an ethnographic way versus having a kind of well-known, and these are well-known novels, you know, like The Namesake and, and Suitable Boy were famous when you took them on. So I'm just wondering if you can talk a little bit about the process and the distinctions um, in how you do this. And a second question was just about, you know, kind of following on on Ashish's, you know, you really kind of lay bare the dark underbelly um, <laughs> brutally. I mean, just where India is today, I'm a political scientist by training. And so I just keep thinking, you know, you have kind of reflected so much of India, India and the world. Um, and so just where we are today, um, you know, I, I can't, I know it moves all of us, but I'm just wondering, you know, where that is in your imagination and in your vision of kind of, of, of the future of your own work. So thank you. <sighs> thank you, Prina. Um, I mean, I, I guess you were asking in the first question about adaptation and how I enter an, a, a novel that I choose to. Firstly, it is when something possesses me completely. With the namesake, it was you know it was like a a fever. I, I felt like I was uh, understood in a way that I uh, that that melancholy that I, so first my first experience of the death of a parent never had that before, and I couldn't believe it. It was medical malpractice that 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 you know that made my mother-in-law die in my arms. You know it's just ridiculous, and I'd never gone through that, and and I I. Uh, in, it was in that just baffled melancholy that I happened to read the namesake. I was going to make the, the ending of Vanity Fair in India, and on the plane, I picked up this book. I had the book with me for six months. I'd never opened it, but I did then. And by the time the plane landed in India, the first thing I did was ring up Chumpa and say, you know, I just have to make this. And she had no, she, we did not know each other. We knew each other a little bit. She'd asked me to do her first novel, and something happened, we couldn't do it. But, um, and she you know, gave it to me instantly. Uh, so so the, with the namesake, it, it came from this powerful bolt of living with my father and mother-in-law for 25, 30 years, the, my whole married life. Um, and this happening to us with her, her, her dying. And, and the only thing that my father-in-law could say was, it was, it was the odd, he kept saying, it's 59 years, it's 59 years. And it was the 59th death, it was the 59th wedding anniversary on which she died. And, and, um, and these were people who were, it was like living with a love story that you never, ever, ever see in life. You never, there's no Valentine's Day cards, there's no I love you, there's no nothing. You know, it's just this incredible, beautiful, stillness between two people who know each other so deeply and well that just a cup of tea with looking at each other was volumes of a kind of emotion that uh, I'd never seen. It was that that propelled me to make the namesake, uh, because the namesake, the book, is really about Gogol. And it's really about this young man that they give birth to and how he's American and so on. But I came to it with a with a point of view that was just deeply about the parents, you know, and Gogol was like a third act as opposed to the main act. So I, I come to most adaptations with a strong point of view because in making film about a novel, you're not you're not making a, every page, uh, you know, on screen. You're not. You shouldn't. You, <laughs> it would not work. Uh, but you have to have a point of view, you know, and. And then you have to sculpt that point of view from a lot to do with Jim, you know, Jumpa's writing. But also, like, like I said, I also grew up 12 years in Calcutta growing up. And I knew it from another point of view. In fact, Jumpa did not know it. She knew it from a Rhode Island sort of point of view. And I remember she came to the rough cut, and there was a scene uh, which is in the film of, of, of Oshima reciting wor words, words, the daffodils. You know, uh, you know, it, we wandered lonely as a cloud. We were, we were taught to stand like this, and we were taught <laughs> to uh, enunciate like British people liked us to sound at that time, whatever. And Jupa, I said, she said, that's, I mean, where did you know that from? Because she hadn't written that. She, uh, you know, but, it was the world in Cal and everywhere else that I knew, you know. So it was a coming together of the coming from that side as well as from this side, which was very rich making. So it's you pull out all the stops, you know, when you want to um, 
when you want to make something come alive, you know. And so it's not about being faithful always to the text, but it's about being, I think, to find a cinematic equivalent to create the spirit uh, of what the text says, but also what you want to say about that, you know. So, um, and and then I come to it really, that's the beauty and the elasticity of making cinema is that you can encompass, like in Monsoon Wedding, I, I used like great contemporary Indian paintings on the walls, you know, like Gaitonde is on the wall and then Jamini Roy is on the wall and, and their end, I mean, there's just amazing amount of great art that I love that I begged and borrowed and brought from other friends and myse myself and, and, and use it in a framing device that if you see the film, you know, it's for me, privately, it's a comment on what's going on in the foreground, you know, and I use color like that. So that's the beauty, that's what I get excited about in, when I make my own films, is that I can use any art, and in the, the namesake, it was contemporary photography that completely fueled uh, the way that the namesake was designed as a series almost of still photographs, you know, as opposed to the freewheeling madness of Monsoon Wedding's camera, which is a fly on the wall camera rather than the elegaic way of looking at Ashima and uh, Ashok's life. So I bring those different things to it all the time. Music is a major thing for me, and it often initiates a. a um, uh, initiate some film. Uh, so the namesake was originally inspired also by uh, Bhatiali, by the songs of the boatman, by the, by, by just wanting, you know, wanting to do something, you know, wanting to make that, uh, something that Nitin Soni had, had, uh, had uh, recorded. And I often go to uh, musicians who have never recorded scores for movies or composed scores like El Subramaniam in the Salam Bombay, uh, like, and also Mississippi Masala, like Nitin Soni, he, he now makes, writes scores, but he didn't before, you know, he made his own music. And then I had a very elaborate weeks, many weeks with him trying to make the soundtrack, which we finally made beautifully, uh, he made in the, for the namesake. So it's a number of elements that the encompassing nature of making cinema can allow. Uh, but mostly it comes from I intuitive response to the subject, you know. Um, and similarly with Suitable Boy. Uh, Suitable Boy was different because the scripts were already written by Andrew Davies, who, who was very English and very much uh, the man of the epic. You know, he did War and Peace, he did uh, Les Miserables. So they already had hired him, the BBC had to do this. And I just could not imagine a world where I would not direct that thing. So I, I said, I have, have to do this. But I did get the script. And, and I liked this distillation to some extent, but it was basically Pride and Prejudice that I got, in the sense that it was all about, will she marry this guy, or will she marry that guy? And for, for me, Suitable Boy is about India. It's about how India became independent, and how what will we make of our country when it's free? That's what it's about. So it was a big deal to try and, you know, sh sh shove that in. I was going to say, <laughs> but 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 uh, but they they hadn't even thought of it, and it's all in the novel, you know. So it was a redoing to some extent, not all. Uh, it was also uh, it was also a victim of a lot of. Uh, stomach, t you know, like belt tightening, hell of a lot of budget cuts, you know, it went from eight hours to if you want to make it, you make it in six or nothing. It was several different problems, you know, that comes when comes when you do these things. I mean, the, the English think it's radical simply to make a South Asian epic. I, I just can't believe it. I looked, I looked at them and said, it's about time, babe. You know, he, this is, they, they used, so for them, it was a big deal that they would even make six hours at all, you know. So it's a, it's a little more difficult in those epic things which were pre-made slightly and to insert my, but I did. I did really struggle as much as I could, notably to return it to Urdu and Hindustani rather than only English all the time. But that was another battle with every syllable. You know. okay. I mean, your second question, where we are today, just this morning I've been served a big fat legal notice from a group in Lucknow that is accusing me personally uh, for making the Tazia fall down in a suitable boy on episode four, whatever, 44th second of the film. 
And I, I couldn't, it just came as I was coming to the Watson Institute this afternoon, and I haven't even read through the whole legal, you know, directive. It was basically, you know. And then when I checked on it, they, they said, oh, you know, aajkal to elections are chal rahe hain, to the, today the elections are, soon the elections are upon us, so they are trying to declare their, their, you know, their allegiance to the powers that be by creating trouble of this nature. So it's, that's what it's really like, you know. Anyway, that's one part of how hard it is. And they've issued, uh, the government has issued directives uh, that are so severe, much more severe in censorship than the Indian censor board used to be, which was the bete noir of our, all our existences, you know, whether you could get past the censor board. Now, it is pre-written and pre-accepted by the streamers, by different channels. If you want to exist, you sign up. You know, so I, I have to still, like, I, I was talking to Asghar Faradi, the great Iranian director, you know, about censorship uh, just three days ago about, like, does it, how, we always look to Iran, you know, as, as the cinema that has, of, you know, sort of used censorship to enhance its own creativity. And he was like, I cannot stand that attitude. No way, censorship does not, he was completely anti censorship and he did not believe that it helped creativity at all you know which was interesting because i thought that actually they had found a way constantly that could you know so now it is really a reflection on on what we will choose to do and i think keeping me out of it i think cinema was is going to change in a massive way in the same way that the streamers changed so so hugely for me i didn't love it all it was a lot of Drek as well. But when I saw Patal Lok, for instance, which was so brilliantly done and so unflinchingly uh, everything, violent and tender and crazy, I, I mean, that's extraordinary, you know. Um, but I don't think that ever, I mean, right now, <laughs> inshallah, uh, that, that, that we can have that type of unflinching look at anything again because of the directives, and I've read them. Uh, they, are, they, are, they are just, uh, they are beyond belief, you know. Uh, in terms of the restrictions. You can't portray polit political people, you can't portray government people, you can't portray poli uh, police people, you can't portray these characters in any other way that would be deemed, you know, like a Tazia falling, I mean, how would I think that that would be, I mean, it elicits a riot in which a Hindu brother stands up for a Muslim brother and, and you know, it elicits something completely different than what they are accusing us of, you know, for instance. So it is, it is, um, it is a con confounding and deeply troubling time in terms of what cinema will be made under those auspices. And I know from a lot of commercial directors that I have as friends in, in Bollywood now, it's all, they're just make, they're going to make rom-coms for the next five years at least, wow. easily. I, I know that for a fact. Um, but I, in terms of even Amrita Shergill, who was bisexual, who was a complete iconoclast, you know, you know, and I don't know, I, I, I don't know which part of her life that they might take offense with, you know. So I have to really, uh, it's, a, it's a very troubling time and I, there are no easy answers, but it's, uh, it's something that is, uh, is, is going to, I think, change the face, alas, of our cinema, which is, I think, can be deeply vigorous and deeply um, a mirror uh, to something quite, innocuous uh, in the face of you know these these directives so it's to be continued thank you i have um, uh, two questions ashu uh, vaziza and then um, i don't know no we have time but no we we have ashu vaziza and then we'll take those two questions uh, simultaneously um, and then i think that's yeah and then there'll be plenty of time uh, afterwards, okay? But you could make your questions. Um, yeah, we, we'll be fine. We're good for time. We're good for time. We're good for time. The undying admiration that I have for your work, um, I've seen only five films. I've not seen all of them, but, but um, the undying admiration that those films created also generated a few points of curiosity. I'll just restrict myself to two in the interest of, of maximizing participation. One, the, 
the place that um, the place that a place has in your artistic imagination. Let me give you an example. So Milan Kundera wrote a famous essay in the in Granta called Prague: A Disappearing Poem, mm -hmm. and explained how Prague is not only the birthplace but also the sustainer of his ima artistic imagination. And he was afraid he might have to leave Prague, mm. and he <coughs> did go away to Paris. Ironically, as after or just before Václav Havel and took over his friend and communism ended. It was a very ironic decision, it's never been explained. But Paris, where he's lived since then, has not given him a home. He hasn't felt that this is anything can replace Prague. Mm. Salman Rushdie was here the other day and spoke of Bombay the same way. Uh, and he, he was confused about between whether India is the birthplace and sustainer of his literary imagination or it's Bombay. Mm -hmm. But it's something, something, uh, the place played a very big place in mm -hmm. his thing. Is there a place in your life which, which is the Prague of Kundera and Bombay of, of Rushti? Is there, a is there a place in your life which generates the same uh, uh, impulse, uh, which, which is the birthplace and or sustainer of your life? So that's question number one. Question number two we started talking about uh, the other day in my office. Uh, Prerna has already mentioned the way you use music. And in my childhood, I was trained. So I, I have a, the way I see how the tal is used or how the swara is used is just it's slightly it's it's not it's not trained for it's not out of training for 10 years or 15 years but three four years of training which generates a way when you your ears get trained in a certain way the use of kangana <laughs> in the reluctant fundamentalist that kavali you as the 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 is casting is taking place then when it begins uh, they are singing in a mehfil Shaman Azmi is there, and uh, Umpuri uh, uh, um is there, and, and, and your main protagonist is there, who's, I think, the son, or, or a nephew, yes. or something. Yeah, yeah. Son. And son, yeah. And, Riz, yeah. and the two Kavals are singing, and a kidnapping is taking place, right? Mm -hmm. It is an arresting fusion of music, excellent music, and um, a remarkable um, scene which is presaging a lot, right? Mm -hmm. So this is a question, I mean, when we write something, we something sometimes appears as an epiphany and we do it, but you do it so regularly. This fusion, <laughs> this brilliant fusion of music and drama that 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 you that you that you manage to produce. So just your a bit of introspection for our education. How does it happen for you? How does how does Kangana appear like that for eight or eight or ten minutes, and and it's it's a complete fusion of words, songs, music, swara, tala, and what's going on? The kidnapping is taking place, and the guys has as as you beautifully put it the other day, he's eating pan, and for you the pan is also depicting the blood the bloodiness of the situation, right? So <laughs> I just leave it there. I don't know, I, I can't formulate it with any greater clarity, but just how you get uh, music and, and, see, and drama so brilliantly fused together. Thank you. Oh, thank, thank you, you Ashutosh, thank you. I mean, often, uh, you know, uh, The Reluctant Fum Fundamentalist is like the hardest movie I made. It took five years to finance. It took, within those five years, it, 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 because it's written, we were talking earlier, it's written as a monologue completely, and it, we made it, a di it had to become a dialogue in order to be a film, and fortunately I worked with the author of the novel, Mohsin Hamid, for several years to do that. So between the uh, deconstructing of the book into a screenplay that could work 
uh, and the impossibility of raising money for that kind of film because post 9-11 the film said pretty much the unsayable and it was the story of the brown man growing up uh, who loved America and then was betrayed by it. So it was a very long, and but when you make, when it's that type of, I, I am known as a long distance runner, I'm not a runner at all, but like I believe in the marathon, I never give up. Um, but you know, then there's some pieces of music that just keep me going. Absolutely, and I have pieces of music almost sometimes for any film, I can tell you what kept me going. Uh, um, right now, it's Aruj Aftab's beautiful song, Mohabbat, which keeps me going through the pandemic. <laughs> but in the, in the case of Reluctant, it was Mori uh, Araj Suno, which I also remade into an incredible song that that Atif Aslam sings in the Re in the Reluctant Fundamentalist. Uh, because my protagonist was male, and uh, Mori Araj Suno was originally, or one of them pieces is sung by Tina Sani, which which I love that piece that kept me going. And it's Mori Araj Suno, you know, it's an appeal to the people above, somebody above, ke, you know, I don't want anything, I just, mujhe bas to, I just want a little bit of respect, and I will not have anything else. I, you may have your kingdom, but I just want my izzat, you know? And it used to keep me going because I used to have so many rejections to make reluctant fundamentalist that I would put on this song and I would just like surrender to its message and to how I would feel, this, you know, that I had to keep on going, you know? So I take these songs very seriously. And, 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 uh, and Kangana was something that I tell you, it was just, it kept me going for years, that song. And especially Faridayas, especially the brothers singing it, you know, the two brothers who, then I talked to them and, and you know, this is what this, these kinds of places that I went to school in gives me the confidence or foolishly or whatever to pursue right to the source of them, right to the singers. And I would, and I would say, Hanji, I'm in India, se hai, aap, you are from Pakistan, I'm from India, maybe you'll say no, whatever, but at least, even if you say no, I'll hear it, but I never let it stop me. So I've, I, I mean, uh, what's her, the great Abda Parveen was coming to do the soundtrack for uh, Kama Sutra, and at the last moment, her visa was permanently denied, <laughs> and she could not come. And so it became Shubha Mudgal, because Abda Ji was not allowed. So I like, for me, these, the making of films are about fertility, you know, about really like working only with that I love, you know, and those I love. So these two pieces of music in The Reluctant were just propelling. They, they, without them, the movie would not exist because I, they, I needed them like, like, like oxygen, you know. And, and in terms of um, knowing music, I also very, very amateurly, but I was telling Srini the other day that I studied the sitar when I was nine, well, like from the age of 10 to 13. Uh, and then my sitar teacher said to me, you have to decide. You can't be a sitar player or an, a theater actor. You can't do two things. You have, it's the biggest aha moment I had when I was a kid is that you know our traditions are so ancient and deep that you can't just do a bunch of things. You have to choose what you focus on. So I... Uh, quit the sitar, but it teaches you so much to even know for three years. Uh, and recently, th but generally I, I listen to at least two hours of Indian classical music a day. I can't wow. sort of exist without it. Yeah, yeah. And, and in the pandemic, I the way that I sort of, you know, it was also a different kind of time. So I, for the first time, took the time to, uh, uh, to study, to learn again uh, Indian classical singing. Uh, this was with Ali Seth, he is my teacher, a great, great musician. And, and because of the Zoom Riyas, we call it Zoom Riyas, uh, we, we have very studied, you know, three hour sessions a week uh, where I, you know, because I want to now, I love, uh, I love uh, our music, but I don't, I, I cannot identify it easily like this is Rar Khamaj or that is Yaman. I can understand some rags, I can identify, but I want to know more. So in the process of knowing, I'm also singing. And it makes a difference, I suppose, you know, it makes you have a real knowledge, uh, or at least an attempt of a knowledge, you know, the beginning of a knowledge uh, of, of, of rhythm, of, of a much deeper understanding of, of, of melody, you know. And in the making of a musical on stage as well, it is the whole 
the whole film of Monsoon Wedding is made in a series of 21 songs on stage. The songs are composed by Vishal Bhardwaj, uh, but how to use music uh, to propel drama in a different live action fashion in theater is deeply about music. It's not about just, you know, it's not, it's really about how to use music to propel drama. So I think a lot of what I do is, is about trying to, is, is doing that, you know, and it's a constant journey and my God, the musicians we have in the Southern, you know, in the South Asian context and here, I mean, there's so many I work with. It's a, it's a great source of uh, the, the most exquisite joy, you know, but always as a, as a learner and not as someone who always, who knows every, anything or everything, but, um, but 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 Kangana was uh, was a propulsive song, and also it came out of the fact that in those years, you remember after the Gulf War and after all that, when Islamists were the ba still the bad guys, but they were always shown as Allahu Akbar became like the bad guy mont motto. You know, Allahu Akbar, Jabi. You know, whenever terrorists were to come, first the prayer would happen. So I was kind of like anti that way of. Of love, of compartmentalizing us, and I chose uh, this other way, which is the incredible robustness of our kawali and of our tradition and of our singing together. But you know, precisely to do, uh, you know, to show the the violence that lurks underneath. In this case, in the case of Kangana, in the case of the beginning of the Reluctant Fundamentalist. Um, and yeah, and it's it's just visual, you know. These the, the, the pan I had to keep. Pan is that red burgundy color is so close to blood, and and I had to keep feeding Farid by you know this pan. <laughs> and he says, "The soup jaga gala, mira ji, soup jaga." And and I <laughs> and I would it must ek or, ek or. and then I would take the camera and go right into his mouth, you know. And and uh, so it was it is dra it is dramatic, and and, and and I'm glad you got it and and. Um, it was the opening of the Venice Film Festival, opening night, uh, Re Reluctant. And, and Michael Mann, whom I, I love his style of filmmaking more than his content sometimes, but I love his, his filmmaking. And he was the president of the jury, and he was like, he, j he told me the same thing, that it was like the eight minutes was the most transcendent cinema. And I, and I kept thinking, like filmmakers do, like, what about the rest of it, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Did it fall apart after that? <laughs> anyway, but thank you for that. And uh, the, the study of Indian classical music is a, is a, is a long and uh, loving endeavor for me. <clears throat> Let's see that. Um, the first part of the question is Place. Oh, place. Oh, right. Um, Oh, um, the place, the place, oh, uh, well, I would say, if, even though I really actively live in three places, I would say that the place that I feel deeply at home uh, is Delhi, is, is where I, is where I uh, you know, spent a lot of my youth and I, my family lives and I've lived there more than a lot of years. And, other places, um, so that's the place that uh, I, you know, and I've always had my own home there, and and that's the place that I need uh, in a in a very in a needed way, you know. Um, but I have to say that when you plant roots in another earth, then the garden becomes also a very deeply sustaining place, mm -hmm. and the only place I have a garden, and I mean. A vast one because it includes the school and my own is in Kampala, uh, where I have planted forever. And I've, I, anywhere I walk in in Kampala around where I live, I have planted trees that are a witness to the years that have gone by. You know, and that is a very powerful emotion uh, that I, I I experience always. So even it doesn't matter to me that I only am there say for three week three week months sometimes and for 10 months sometimes, and it's not so regular, but but I, uh, it's the trees that speak to me so deeply and teach me so much. And so it's it's a little, I wouldn't call it a toss up because Delhi is much more an embracing sense of old home, you know, like, 
because it's a place where I can go to the to the pawn shop and meet uh, my best friend when I was 10 years old, you know. And that's very hard to do <laughs> in any other place. And it really makes me feel so much a connection with the tapestry of the life I have come through, through that city. Um, yeah, but it's not so simple, as you know. It's uh, now that we've become so many places in us. But these are the two places that I would. Um, and New York is the place that allows me to work, you know, to, to be an artist of all. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a greatly, it an, uh, allows me to, yeah, to ha have a sense of a creative community that uh, over the years. So it's an amalgam of things, yeah. Thank you. Another question from over here? Okay. So I, can I ask, there are one, two, three. Can we take them together? Okay. Let's start with uh, uh, you at the back, my friend, and then in front. And <coughs> Thank you. I just wanted to say I'm a big fan, and your work has inspired a lot in me. And you actually answered a lot of my questions, but I still wanted to ask you about the reluctant fundamentalist, because it's really different from the rest of your work. And it's, it's so effortless in conveying something that's so sensitive, the entire plot of it. And I wanted to know what inspired you and were there any instances that you may have felt that it was a risky project? And if you did, uh, what helped you overcome those feelings? Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Please. Um, I'll just begin by apologizing on behalf of all people from Lucknow. I am Lucknow and uh, my name is Rupam. Hai. Um, I'm a Fulbright here at the Center for Language Studies. Um, I have two questions. I'll make them very terse. Sure. First is you've spoken um, at great length about uh, the kind of struggle you go through when you're making a movie. Um, what for you is the purpose of art? And from, from the maker of Salam ba Bombay and in a world where Slam Dog Millionaire exists, what do you think? of present day Hindi Indian cinema. Huh? Yeah. Wow. Wow. <laughs> Short, quick, quick, especially the one about the meaning of art. <laughs> well asked, well asked. Hello, Miraji, thank you so much for that wonderful talk. Um, I'm, my name is Sarvesh, I'm a freshman here, and I just had two quick questions. One is not directly related to your work, but you spoke about how in India we have a tendency to subsume the self. Um, and how do you feel in that? In the old days. In the old days, yeah. <laughs> so my question is, how do you feel that tendency has evolved over time from when you grew up until now? And because uh, I'm from a small town in India, um, in Tamil Nadu, and it's something that I have uh, experienced. It's something that I have seen that we're always taught uh, to, um, you know, think about what will happen to the family and think about what will happen to the community um, over, uh, you know, yeah. purely. Um, individual benefit. So I want to know uh, what your thoughts are about how that has evolved and how and how um, you know central that is to the Indian spirit, if such a thing if such a thing exists. And uh, secondly, I wanted to ask about the namesake. Uh, for me as well, when I read it and when I watched the movie, I still cry every time I watch. But um, for me also, it was more about the parents than it was about Google. And for you, while directing the movie, uh, for me. Ashima was honestly the star of the novel for me, and how uh, she, you know, grew from the first chapter while reading, and from the beginning of the movie till the end, the sort of character transformation that she goes through and the um, conscientiousness that she develops. Um, and how was it for you to, um, you know, direct uh, Ashima's role, and how, um, w what approach did you use while, you know, trying to um, give life to the transformation that she went through? Um, ultimately to being uh, a very, very, you know, um, complex character at the end where she doesn't honestly know where she belongs. Um, I think there's a line in the book where, say, where it says, um, uh, though it, she will never truly feel at home within these walls on Pemberton Road, she knows that this is home nevertheless. And I want to know how you perceived her character transformation. Sorry, the thank question you, was long. Thank you very thank much. You. So you don't have to answer all of these rich questions. Okay. Again, with a, a quick response to the spirit of all three would be yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> delicious. Especially, especially one man response to the meaning of art. <laughs> the purpose of art. Well, um, for the purpose of art, um, 
It's a very Lucknowy question, huh? the purpose <laughs> of art. I love it. I love it. I mean, for me to be very idealistic in the beginning, the whole thing was about can art change the world? Can art change anything? And I meant it as art, which is not like didactic or agitprop message pointing stuff that a lot of people do. And I, I believe in some of it, but it's not for me art. You know, art is much more about being complicated in uh, and using uh, using well in several ways using beauty uh, and and how life shows you that beauty to reveal something that you know you know what Ashish was saying about the underbelly you know it was how to use something that might appear one way to actually reflect upon another way so to show the dimensionality of things but art is also about the medium you choose to make art with you know and that's why i think when i see films that are didactic i think this is not for a film that's like a radio play you're telling me what it is right it's not for me artistic at all you know whereas how to use our medium is uh, critical to what i would consider is art you know um uh, the inspiration for reluctant fundamentalist somebody asked me right uh, yeah um you know, for me, the inspiration was going to Pakistan for the first time in 2007, I think it was. I was invited to go by Ali Sethi, who was a young student at the time, and he'd heard me speak somewhere, and he called me and my husband, who's also a, pro a political scientist, Mahmoud, Mahmoud uh, Mamdani, to come and speak in, in, in Pakistan. And my father came from Lahore before partition. And uh, as you know, for Indians, it's not so simple to get to Pakistan. My mother is from Amritsar, and she would tell me stories growing up of, you know, we would just they say, Aaj kal to, we want to eat pastries in Lahore, so we would drive across 30 miles and have a lovely movie and then, the, you know, and then come home. And it was that kind of complete interwoven uh, culture between Lahore and Amritsar, and Punjab in general was not a divided state, you know. Anyway, we, I had never been, but I had grown up in Orissa, everywhere else, with a very much of a, what they call Ganga Jamna culture, you know, very much the ghazal, very much Urdu. My, only, my father doesn't read Devanagri, he doesn't write it. He only wrote, uh, spoke Persian and Urdu. In the old days, the men were always taught that and the women were taught Devanagri. So uh, we grew up in that atmosphere. We grew up with that music. We grew up with Begum Akhtar every day in our, in our homes, you know. And it was the study of the ghazal. It was the study of all that that really was my binding, in a sense. So when I got to Pakistan, I was just just stunned by firstly how everyone looked like me, you know, looked like us, like Punjabi folk, you know, and 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 how we were just taken in completely, fully, and and the hospitality, the grace, the the the, the elegance, uh, the live music everywhere I went, and the, just the refinement of it. Uh, you all must go to see, of course, Shazia Sikandar's work that's just opening again here at RISD Museum, uh, Extraordinary Realities. It's an absolutely extraordinary chronicle of her becoming an artist since from the National School of Art, Lahore to now. And it's extraordinary. And I had known all that, but I had never been there. And so I was blown away. And I want the inspiration was, I must make a modern film about contemporary Pakistan, because we'd never seen that. You know, I had never seen that. And then, one like six months later, uh, they gave me the manuscript version before Reluctant was published. I got the manuscript uh, from a friend, and, and 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 that's when I reached out to Mohsin. And it was the it was it was just an amazing book because I, you know, I was tired. I was telling Leela today that I was tired of like the Jack Kerouacs and the On the Road and the white memoirs that I've constantly read, but I had never re read one or about a world about a brown young man who loved America and then who came here just like we all have in some ways, was co-opted completely, rose to the top of what he considered America, Wall Street, and then was betrayed. He would never be considered an American again because of 9-11. And that story has never been told, like how we do, do that, what, and the journey we traverse. So it was the going to Pakistan that gave me the desire to do that. And then the novel gave me the, the foundation to, to do that. Um, um, the subsuming of self, uh, you know, I see so much of how India has changed in that respect. <laughs> it is remarkable. Like, you know, it's remarkable in terms of the 
flamboyance of it, the the emphasis on success, basically, has become more gl so global. So you know, so the globalizing of our notion of success and and achievement and acquisition and material goods and the fact that there is nothing now that is different between this and that, here and there, in terms of even what they we aspire for, you know. So it's a very shocking change for me that it's no longer how we grew up, you know, which is, we never even said the word I. I, I really don't recall doing that. And so it was very much an active example of how we had to think. And that was still 50, uh, 60s, you know, and 70s. But now we've come a very different way. And, and I think between it's not. It's no longer. It's. Uh, I can't even see sometimes vestiges of of that subsuming of self. I think it is much more the avaricious uh, that I see, uh, and um, except except in certain artistic realms like say musicians or the music world, still for me feels very much about the parampara of the past, you know, about the guru shishya, about the, those values, but not otherwise. I mean, so many. Other ways, I just feel like it's just a different, almost a different world. Except, except that family is still venerated above us. You know that we are just part of a bigger thing, but not the, the self. That self is really a value. I mean, pushed there now in a different way. And the and the government, you know, tells us all the time that this is how to be. You know, um, um, and Oshima, in the namesake, was. Uh, to some extent, also my own dream, you know, like I don't think she sings in the book and she goes back to sing and finds her solace through music, but that is my fantasy personally and and uh, and that's how we did her because I did not want her to feel defeated in any way. her life had to be lived and and uh, she had to she had to she had to embrace that you know in in Ashok's passing. So that was again also because of my love for that type of music and, and classical stuff that, that you weave all that in to create a se sense of a sinuous passage that she is still making into into uh, we hope a kind of harmony you know so that was that was that so you you know you take great license when you make films you know of how to instill yourself and what you love uh, in those films so um, yeah. But but Jhumpa uh, loves the film and 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 excuses me all of it. She doesn't want to excuse. She said it's. She I won't tell you what she told me, but she told me oh, something okay. very beautiful. <laughs> anyway, oh. like well, she said that the, the namesake has two mothers. I'm not going to tell oh. you the other nice thing, but she <laughs> says uh, the namesake has two mothers and we are the mothers. Oh. Uh, and it's uh, she and I, and oh. we are very very close. I mean, I'm very happy to say that the, all the writers that I've worked with. Um, they are like part of my family. They are really like my family, you know. And that's saying something because I do love these books uh, for what they are. They are not to be just changed in a way that is not recognizable to the spirit of those books. So that's what I think the authors all have felt in the, the adaptations. Wow. Well, Mira, Ashish, Karan, I, I, I must say I can't thank you enough for an unusually beautiful. Really? wise and and healing <laughs> afternoon. Um, please um, uh, join me in thanking our absolutely exquisite yeah. guests.